This video is the fifth in a series on the 33 strategies of war by Robert Greene. War is a state of conflict between opposing nations, societies, or groups. A strategy is a plan of action or a policy designed to achieve a major overall aim within a conflict. This series is not intended to glorify the violence of war. Rather, the strategies and examples given will encompass all manner of human conflicts. Although you may never find yourself in physical confrontation and may pride yourself in the avoidance of violence, these strategies may prove useful in confronting and overcoming the obstacles that stand in the way of your goals and desired achievements. Strategy 5, Command and Control Strategy, The Snares of Group Think. Part 1, The Broken Chain. The problem with leading any group is that people inevitably have their own agendas. If you are too authoritarian, they will resent you and will rebel in silent ways. If you're too easygoing, they will revert to their natural selfishness and you will lose control. Robert Greene. In the 2003 film, Master and Commander, Far Side of the World, we follow the story of the HMS Surprise, her crew, and Captain Jack Aubrey in a fictionalized high sea adventure set during the Napoleonic Wars. The captain, played by Russell Crowe, understands the necessity of maintaining military discipline while far from home port. For there are many dangers that can take a man's life, besides the enemy's cannons. There are treacherous seas and foul weather to navigate, also the ever-present possibility of careless accidents. Throughout the film, Captain Aubrey displays many facets of leadership, both to his subordinate officers and the underclass of crewmen, some of whom are much older than the officers they serve under. He not only demonstrates leading by example well under fire, he also exemplifies this and teaches this to his younger officers. Stand tall on the quarterdeck, son, all of us. Miss Boyle, run up the colors. Aye, sir. He offers men rewards for their hard work. Well done, lads. Extra ration of grog for all of you. And makes additional efforts to praise men when they have done a good job. Two feet six inches, sir. And holding. Good work, Mr. Lamb. Thanks. However, when an incident of insubordination occurs, where a lower ranking crew member shoves an officer in full sight of himself and the rest of the crew, stand fast! He does not hesitate to act. Master at arms! Take that man below and clap him in irons. He calls out the act of insubordination Aye, and brings on the full weight of punishments to both men. Bring Holland down to my cabin. The officer is scolded in private, as a good leader should make every effort to only praise in public and scold in private. The man pushed past you without making his obedience, yet you said nothing. Why? I intended to, sir, but the right words just didn't... The right words? The captain is clearly upset that the officer did not correct the issue himself, as he should have. This officer is displaying poor leadership, and Jack attempts to offer this as a stern lesson in good stewardship. Don't make friends with the former Jack's lad. They'll despise you in the end, think you're weak. No, sir. Nor do you need to be a tyrant. As was the custom in the military at the time, the crew member is flogged in front of the rest of the crew to deter further transgressions. After the flogging, the crewman is brought right back into the fold with the expressed understanding that the lesson was learned. Because once a punishment is executed, let that be the end of it. You need to offer men the opportunity to learn from their past mistakes. For an example of an overly authoritarian captain, we can look at the true events of the mutiny on the bounty, which has been made into several films. In the 1984 version titled The Bounty, Anthony Hopkins plays Captain William Blythe, while Mel Gibson portrays Master's Mate Fletcher Christian. After making a successful but hazardous expedition to the Fiji Islands, believing the crew has become too relaxed while resupplying on the tropical island, Captain Blythe becomes increasingly agitated, taking each and every small transgression as a personal slight at his authority. I understand you dismissed the swabbing party. You left these decks crusted with grime. Look at it there! He, in turn, takes out his frustrations on the crew, and particularly on Fletcher Christian. Stop, Fuzzy! You luck! 
I see nothing, sir, but your finger. I don't have your vile ways brought aboard my ship, sir! Ordering more and more monotonous tasks to be completed, then scolding the men for not completing the tasks competently or timely. The crew begin to find solace in each other and plot against the authoritative captain and the crew that are still loyal to him. What are you saying, Ned? Are you inciting me to mutiny? If I were you, I'd take the ship, that's all. Eventually, in the dead of night, the disenfranchised crew, led by Fletcher Christian, mutiny and set the captain and his remaining loyal crew member adrift in a life raft, taking the ship and turning her back to Fiji. As we see in the case of the bounty, bad attitudes, belly grumbling, and disenfranchisement can spread amongst the rank and file of the crew. Naturally, people will resort to tribal affiliation and survival situations. In the 1939 film, The Northwest Passage, based on a historical fiction novel by Kenneth Roberts, Spencer Tracy portrays the real life and near mythological character of Major Robert Rogers, founder of Rogers Rangers, a British officer, frontiersman, explorer, and American folk hero prior to the days of Davy Crockett and Wired Earp and just as controversial. The film depicts a nearly historical account of his raid on the pro-French Indian village of St. Francis during the Seven Years' War. The raid would require stealthful navigation through French-held territory and a trek through the North American frontier. After the successful navigation of the lake, trouble begins brewing between separate factions of the British regular troops added to the rangers to bolster their numbers, as well as the Mohawk Indian scouts also added to the expedition at the last moment. The Mohawks were ordered to go on the raid by their British commander and have been sabotaging the trip in order to return home to their tribe before the harvest. Johnson, understand there is time make war and time not make war. This is not time make war. If they will not obey orders, they must return to Crown Point. Now, if they tell the real reason they came back, General Amherst might have them shot, so they will say they became sick. They may be called old women for doing so, but it's better to be called old women than to be shot. <laughs> they will return at once by land. The British regulars, being from England, feel they are superior to the colonial natives that make up the rank and file of the rangers. You think, you and your Highlanders and your black Irish, you ain't rangers. Your brass button soldiers filled up with poison skunk water and sawdust! A fight inevitably breaks out between the British regulars and the rangers. And in the confusion of the melee, an individual Mohawk takes the opportunity to sabotage the gunpowder storage. After the brawl, Rogers quickly takes command of the situation. The moment discipline's gone, everything's gone. Major, I thought it was important. Captain Butterfield, you're going back. You'll report to General Amherst that you got sick too. You're sick and so is every man with a powder burn who goes back with you. And dismisses the regulars, the Mohawks, and all those too injured to continue on the journey. Your command, you can't afford to lose that many, Major. Insisting that he can accomplish more with fewer but more disciplined troops. Captain Williams, you're going back because you're in no condition to go on. But most of you are going back because you can't maintain discipline. I'd make this expedition with 50 men, yes, with 10 men. And I'd do more with those 10 than I could with 200 who didn't obey orders. Part two, remote control. You have to create a chain of command in which people do not feel constrained by your influence yet follow your lead. Put the right people in place who will enact the spirit of your ideas without being automatons. Robert Greene. Returning to the 1939 film Northwest Passage, after a successful raid on St. Francis, Rogers is loathsome to not find the stores he was expecting in the village to supply his return march out of French territory. What provisions? None, sir. What? The French took them. There's nothing left here but a few baskets of parched corn. Put them in the canoes. Got a long way to go on that corn. With the French army close at his heels, he pushes his smaller force to move quickly with little rest and nearly no food. Now put yourselves in the shoes of that French commander, the one that found our boats. If he's guessed we made a beeline for Memphis Magog, he made a beeline for here too. My men are mighty hungry. Yes, sir. Oh. They've got corn left, haven't they? Captain Jacobs, Kakapot. Eventually, 
he must humbly come to his soldiers and hear their complaints on the conditions of the exposition and his leadership. And if we can't hunt here, we think we should hold an officer's council and take a vote on what's the best thing to do. Well, that's regulations if you want to do it that way. I vote to get on to Wentworth as soon as we can. My men are starving. If we don't find something to eat somewhere quick, we won't go anywhere. He hears their complaints and listens to their suggestion that smaller parties of troops would have more luck foraging for food while on the move than in a large column. Well, sir, it's, it's pretty hard to drive hungry men. But I think we'd be better off if we stick together. You do? Yeah, 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 let's all take a look at it. All right, we'll vote. He makes the decision, maintaining his authority while providing the necessary leadership to each group to maintain control. He allows the group to break up, to forage and hunt while on the move, and gives his orders to meet up again. Each group experiences different outcomes. Some gather the much needed food to sustain the march, while others are ambushed and decimated. Such is the risk of segmenting your forces. However, the spirit of the group remains intact. Because of the leadership in place, the main body does reunite and continues their trek home. In the 1998 film, Saving Private Ryan, the film opens with the fictional character Captain Miller, played by Tom Hanks, landing on Omaha Beach in the second wave of troop landings. Captain Miller encouraged his men to continue up the beach as they wade through the dead bodies of the soldiers from the first wave of troop landings. Miller was expecting to land on the beach that was mostly secured by the first wave. First wave, ineffective! We do not hold the beach, say again! We do not hold the His beach. mission was not necessarily to command the assault on the defensive. However, because Captain Miller understood the overall goal of the D-Day mission, it's got to be that cut on the right, or is it the one on the left? No, no, Shit. no, no, no. is to the west, this is Dog One. He takes command of his remaining troops. Bangalores! Bring up the Bangalores! And those that he finds on the beach to assault forward, and eventually securing the beachhead for additional landings to continue taking place. Fire low! In the German language, there are two words for command, Auftag and Befehl. Befehl is an order to be obeyed to the letter, where Auftag is a more broad statement of an overall mission. Miller has an overall understanding of the mission beyond his individual part in it. When he finds himself on the beach that was not secured by the first wave, he cannot obey his Befehl, so he reverts to his Auftag the overall mission to defeat the enemy. Later in the film, this becomes an issue. Keys to Warfare. Make your commands clear and inspiring, focusing attention on the team, not the leader. Create a sense of participation, but do not fall into the trap of groupthink. The irrationality of collective decision-making. Make yourself look like a paragon of fairness but never relinquish the unity of command. Robert Greene. The 2000 film, Remember the Titans, depicts Coach Boone, played by Denzel Washington, who in 1971 coached the fully integrated T.C. Williams High School football team to a 13-0 season, a state championship, and finished second place in the Nationals. In the film, Coach Boone has to lead a politically and culturally divided group of young high school students into a cohesive football team. You look like a bunch of fifth grade sissies after a cat fight. You got anger, that's good, you're gonna need it, son. You got aggression, that's even better, you're gonna need that too. But any little two-year-old child can throw a fit. Football is about controlling that anger, harnessing that aggression into a team effort to achieve perfection. He does so by creating an authoritative presence, not tolerating any dissent, not tolerating any griping or complaining from any member of the team. What did you say? say we need a water break. You need a water break. We are going to do up downs until Blue is no longer tired and thirsty. <laughs> All discipline he distributes is to the team. 
as a cohesive unit. In doing so, he unites them as a team that is both loyal to the team itself, to each other, while maintaining his authoritative command. Like all the other schools in this conference, they're all white. They don't have to worry about race. We do, but we're better for it, man. Let me tell you something, you don't let anything, nothing, come between us. Nothing tears us apart. Again, in the 1998 film, Saving Private Ryan, Captain Miller, who is focused on his individual mission, is Beth Fell. This Ryan better be worth it. He'd better go home, cure some disease, or invent a longer lasting light bulb or something. But also is aware of the overall goal, the off tag. When you end up killing one of your men, you, see, you tell yourself, it happened. So you could save the lives of two or three or ten others. Maybe a hundred others. While on the titular mission to find Private Ryan, his squad comes across a German machine gun nest. When Captain Miller gives the order to assault the position, there is pushback from his squad. So, Captain, what I'm trying to say is, why don't we just go around the... I hear what you're saying. We really can't go around it. I'm with Robin on this one, sir. They suggest that this is not part of their mission. They see their mission only as finding Private Ryan and bringing him to safety. Captain Miller is thinking about the off tag, the overall mission. Seems like an unnecessary risk, given our objective, sir. Our objective is to win the war. Captain Miller does not allow the collective thinking of the group to influence his decision and quickly squashes any dissent. Maybe I should go up the middle, sir. The way you run, I don't think so. Maybe I should go left, sir. Maybe you should shut up. The squad reluctantly follows the captain and successfully assaults the machine gun nest. However, the squad suffers a casualty as a major setback to the group's morale. They have also taken a prisoner. You gotta be kidding me, we'll let him go. He's a POW arriving. Can't take him with us. Our guys will pick him. The group's decorum begins to break down further after the captain releases the prisoner so that they may continue on their mission. Captain, you just let the enemy go. This is such bullshit. There is now a rift growing between what was once a tight unit under a strong commanding leader. Factions quickly start to develop and soldiers start taking sides. Captain Miller offers no apology or compromise of his command to the other factions. Instead, Sometimes I wonder if I've changed so much my wife is even going to recognize me whenever it is I get back to her. How I'll ever be able to, to tell her about days like today. Ah, uh, Ryan. He is able to refocus the attention of the soldiers back onto the reason they are there. Why it is important and why they have to continue on. Part four, the reversal. No good can come from divided leadership. If you are ever offered a position in which you would share command, turn it down. For the enterprise will fail and you will be held responsible. Better to take a lower position and let the other person have the job. It is always wise, however, to take advantage of your opponent's faulty command structure. Robert Greene. In Remember the Titans, Herman Boone's assistant coach was passed over for the head coaching position. And I'm sorry about the way things went down, but uh, come view me, the whole city. I think that it would go a long way to smooth things over if you would stay, work on the staff, be a defensive coordinator, assistant head coach. Work under you. Instead of fighting for control of the team, he accepts the position as assistant coach and leader of the defense and does his best job he can within the limited position. Another yard. You blitz all night. And if they cross the line of scrimmage, I'm gonna take every last one of you out. You make sure they remember forever the night they played the Titans. Allowing the team to succeed or fail by the leader. If the team succeeds or fails, it will not be because of him. If the team were to fail, the job would likely be his. As it happens, the team is completely successful, and that also shows favorably on him and his abilities. 
This has been a production of Minimum Effort Media. If you would like to own a copy of The 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene, please do so using a link in the description below. That will help benefit the channel. I also be giving away a free copy of the book. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber with notifications turned on, like the video, and leave a comment down below. The previous winner was randomly selected by me and is on screen right now. Please contact me at the Lazy Stoic across all social media so I can get your contact information. And thank you for watching.